Um, I am delighted uh, to welcome on stage, I'm, I'm hoping he's somewhere, our wonderful customer, Sourceability, Yashar. Are you, are you able to join us on stage? Give a ring, round of applause. All right, Thank awesome. You. So there we are, all yours. Just back for that middle one. one. Okay, middle one. Awesome. Great. Good morning, everybody. Nice meeting you. My name is uh, Yashar Shahabi. I'm just gonna hold on. Get this. I think this is not my presentation, so I'll just wait. Okay. So. Um, the title of my presentation is our billion dollar journey with Spryker, you know, so I was hoping that that's going to like, you know, wake everybody up, you know, the word billion dollar, you know, uh, you know, was on purpose out here. So um, I work for a company called Sourceability, but like every other uh, humble businessman, first I'm going to talk about myself, you know, that's like the, always the most important thing, um, you know. Um, so as I said, my first name is Yashar Shahabi. My name just got butchered by Paulina. I told her that in the background, I'm going to complain. But, you know, I guess I have my ancestors that complain about that, or maybe not. Um, so I'm actually an electronic components engineer, you know, so uh, that's what, you know, my profession by background since I'm a teenager. I bragged about it back in Berlin. I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to try to hopefully move forward a little bit and talk about, you know, our relationship with the Spiker and hopefully our value add proposition and, you know, why we chose Spiker and why hopefully, you know, some of you are out here can make some good decisions, you know, in the same realm. Um, now, who we are, you know, Sourceability is a startup company. You know, we are basically an electronic component. Sorry about this. I'm getting a little bit annoyed with this microphone. Um, we are basically a technology company in the electronic component supply chain industry. Um, we founded the company back in 2015. And uh, after seven years, we have a projection of doing a billion dollar, you know, in revenue this year, you know, which we have been very, very uh, happy with. And um, not trying to be a Spryker salesperson here, I'm going to talk about it, how Spryker you know, helped us out with a lot of different things here. So we are a, um, an American company headquartered in Miami. You know, we have a technology center in Berlin you know, where we actually discovered a Spryker, and also in Southern California where I live. Um, we um, have been in a very uh, lucky position, you know, unfortunately because of COVID, but fortunately for us where uh, the trend of digitalization in terms of shopping, buying electronic components, although we are focused that B2B, you know, massively got accelerated. And, um, and you may have known, you know, um, because for example, of the, uh, the car allocations, what happened with the uh, cars, if you've been buying, leasing, you know, where uh, the most of the big manufacturers couldn't have, you know, cars out there because of not being able to get hold of electronic components. So if somebody here is from the automotive industry, you know, by any chance, I heard there's somebody from Volkswagen, I'm very interested to talk later, but basically we made a lot of money, you know, selling to the automotive companies this year, you know, where in the last couple of years they always ignored us, you know, thinking that, oh, you know, we're going to buy electronic components directly from the manufacturers, right, you know, and then all of a sudden they got just caught off guard, you know, and we had all these availabilities in our marketplace e-commerce platform, which is actually called SourceEngine.com, what is uh, based on, you know, the Spryker technology. So... Moving forward, I'm going to try to be, uh, you know, a bit of a salesperson for the semiconductor industry, try to uh, make it attractive because a lot of people, electronic components, semiconductor, they already start yawning. So, like me being an immigrant, you know, here in the United States for the last five years, it is an American immigrant story. So, uh, a, a Swiss engineer, Jean Herney, or however that, you know, we pronounce his name, you know, famously with a couple of his colleagues from Shockley Electronics or Shockley Semiconductor, made a move started their own company called Fail Child Electronics, which is an American brand, still exists in the electronic industry, and it started what is called Transistor, you know, back already in the 50s. So really this industry is started in this country and, you know, being in the Midwest in the heart of America, which I've never been, only heard about it, you know, I thought that it's appropriate that I give a little bit of a, you know, give a little of a credit or reference, you know, to this American uh, uh, immigrant story. Now, where does the semiconductor industry stay, you know, here right now in the world? I hear a lot about, oh, you know, the Chinese took over or the Asians took over. There's nothing more America. It's all false. Trust me. You know, it's all media, which we all know how to, you know, um, um, dramatize everything and make it look like, oh, you know, what is going on? Um, United States still accounts for almost half of the world semiconductor output, or at least the American companies do, okay? So this is really important. So we, let's be proud of that, you know, as, uh, you know, um, Anybody that lives in the Western Hemisphere under the American leadership, you know, don't want to get into politics. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to give as much credit as possible. You know, in the end of the day, I live here. So um, now, um, the, the, when, and half of the half, 
right? So the United States, again, accounts for 40% of the output for the semiconductor industry, and half of that is actually manufactured in the United States. That's, that is still a big portion, considering that this is not a cheap country. Trust me, I know. I live in Southern California. You know, I pay for it every day, you know, from the time that I wake up, go to grocery store to my seven bucks, you know, a gallon, uh, 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 you know, fuel. Um, still doing all of that under the circumstances where it is a very expensive country, I think it's, 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 a, it's a pretty good, um, I would say, attribution, you know, or contribution towards the American economy. Um, it accounts for almost like 2 million jobs, 1.9 million jobs directly and directly here in the United States. Again, important statistics. And it is the number four most uh, um, on top in terms of what America exports to the world. Okay, so it, it, it is a very important, you know, industry, uh, industry. It is across 18 different states. And the Americans and or these American companies in the semiconductor industry spend one-fifth of their income, you know, in R&D, okay? So we are well ahead, you know, in terms of, you know, the semiconductor industry, the innovation, the manufacturing, you know, in compared to the rest of the world, in compared to China, Japan, you know, South Korea, Taiwan, you know, and, and something that I didn't put here, I should have, you know, the Americans also, you know, um, um, own the uh, ecosystem, you know, so everything that gets innovated has intellectual property, and that's why protecting those IPs are very important. So essentially that ensures that somehow one way or the other things come back, you know, here to the United States. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about allocations, the shortages. Why, you know, you couldn't negotiate your car, you know, at the car dealership, you know, below MSRP. You know, I got lucky. I got my Mercedes right before the pandemic, you know, and I did a great negotiation. I went to the uh, car dealer in Southern California. It's a company called Fletcher Jones. They're very famous. They're probably the largest car dealership here in the United States, you know, was December 2019, you know, I managed to easily negotiate a nice AMG at a very, very good price. I'm not trying to brag about what I'm driving. I'm just trying to put a point together here. You know, I didn't, you know, I, I sat there, I talked, the guy said, no, I walked out. I said, that's it, I'm not doing it. You know, they, they felt, uh, what's, what's wrong with this guy? And then they ran behind me like two minutes later, went back, you know, negotiated a good, you know, price, great. You can't do that anymore, at least, you know, not in California. Cars went on allocation. They couldn't churn cars out, whether it was like big American brands or um, um, European brands. Uh, why? So here is the deal. 30% of the cost of a car these days is on electronic components. I'm not talking about the wiring and the harness, all those kind of stuff. Just on electronic components. By 2030, I don't have a slide for it here. I just did a presentation you know, for the uh, um, 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 bunch of car manufacturers in Germany where my CEO is actually presented this week. By 2030, half of the cost of a car is going to be in electronic components. Now, what happened is, according to the chart that I put out here, you have to be on the electronics industry, it's a just-in-time delivery. You have to be below 80% of the fab uh, utilization in order to keep the balance on supply and demand. That went away because the supply and demand or the whole supply chain of electronic components got massively disrupted during the COVID. Everybody shut down. Car manufacturers buy, were not buying electronic components. They were confused. The whole balance went away. You know, my chart doesn't go to 2022. Right now, we're at almost 95% to 100% capacity. That doesn't allow on-time delivery of electronic components. You know, and if you later want to find me, and I can explain that, I want to go through in my presentation, and uh, um, that essentially made massive allocations, you know, <laughs> allowed us also, as well as Spryker's help, the allocation helped us to get to a billion dollar revenue. Okay, moving on, what do we do? Sorry about these, I didn't send the presentations to Spryker like this, so sorry about the, uh, you know, words getting up, not blaming you guys, words getting all, you know, jumbled up. Um, what do we have? SourceEngine.com, which is what we started with a Spryker. And we're one of the early adopters of Spryker back in 2016. It's a marketplace e-commerce platform for a professional buyer buying electronic components. And, uh, um, and that is basically what we have built together with a Spryker. Um, I, I'm going to get into some details about it. But before I go there, um, this is a very complex industry. So again, from the early 50s, where the semiconductor have been discovered. Believe it or not, we deal with around a billion SKUs. You know, so this couple of months ago, nine months ago, when I was back in Berlin, by then in our product information management system, we had around, I think, 600 million SKUs. Now we've almost doubled that. We're over a billion SKUs. So billion SKUs, 11,000 different component manufacturers, okay? You know, and we have around 3,600, you know, uh, sellers or merchants you know, trying to set a billion SKUs from 11,000 different, you know, manufacturers. So that's a challenge that we were facing, which we tried to address, 
together with a Spryker, you know, when we started, you know, SourceEngine.com. So, um, what are the, some of the statistics? You know, again, we target the professional buyer's market. This is not a place, you know, if you're a hobbyist and you want to make a small radio for your kid, you know, or, you know, repair your wine fridge or whatever else, you don't come to SourceEngine.com. You wouldn't even know how to search there because we have no keyword search. We only have SKU search, okay? So we have a uh, 60,000 plus buyers today in, you know, in our industry. Probably in our industry doesn't have more than 100, 120,000 buyers anyway, so that's a good you know, um, a place for us. You know, again, these are the people that they get paid to buy electronic components. Very B2B, so we have to customize the hell out of what we had with a Spryker. I'll talk about it you know, um, when the uh, right slide comes. And, um, and we do around seven to $10 million transaction on Source Engine directly but indirectly, you know, that's probably, you know, five to seven times um, 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 larger because we're a billion dollar company. We attribute around $400 million of our transaction to what comes from SourceEngine.com, you know, and we've been trying to optimize for that, right? You know, a lot of big companies, they have ERP systems, so we do a lot of ERP integrations. They don't want to do the checkout on Source Engine. They want to send you a purchase order, you know, and whatnot. So, but um, essentially that is, you know, some rough statistics about SourceEngine.com. We have tools inside you know, our marketplace e-commerce platform. You know, one of them is called Code Engine. Nobody wants to buy one single electronic component if you're a Foxconn or an Apple or a Dell you know, or GM, right? You, know, you have a list of electronic components that you're buying. In our industry, it's called BOM. You know, I've, I've gotten caught in some airports you know, talking on a conference call about a BOM. You know? <laughs> but uh, basically, it's a bill of material, you know, essentially a list of electronic components that you know, a manufacturer, you know, or a subcontractor manufacturer wants to basically put together to uh, um, uh, uh, buy electronic components. You know, again, we build that actually together with a Spiker um, back in the days, you know, and there's an opportunity to even appify it. You know, I just got inspired based on the presentations that I was just looking at, you know, hopefully I'll have an opportunity to talk to Elena or Manishi um, about that, you know, and, and later. Okay, so um, in a nutshell, SourceAbility, our company and our marketplace e-commerce platform, you know, Source Engine, you know, focused that digital transformation of the electronic components supply chain industry. Our value add proposition is, again, our marketplace, bringing the merchants together, making a very sophisticated um, industry in terms of lots of SKUs, being confused where to buy from and all the rest, right? You know, a lot more streamlined and better, and, and we definitely did prove for our business partners, like for instance on the automotive industry, what, would, what could that bring in, you know, moving forward? Believe it or not, you know, um, um, I, I was asked by Andrew, you know, to talk about a little bit what is going to happen to in this industry in terms of the allocations. I'm going to squeeze it here. I don't have an special, you know, slide for it. Um, our prediction is that, of course, like what happened um, during the beginning of the pandemic, where somehow everybody was buying a lot of toilet papers. You know, remember that? you know, and hoarding them, you know, in their, you know, whatever else, you know, God knows why. The same thing happened with electronic components, right? You know, it's incredible. The human species, whether you're a professional buyer, you know, or a average buyer for your groceries, you hoard. So what we see is a, quite a bit of a cool off in the allocations. Like, as I said, the, uh, um, the production lines have been brought back online. You know, there's been a lot of different um, new investments that have happened. And there's been a lot of hoarding of electronic components, including by the automotive companies, not mentioning names. So we know that we're going to have starting having new merchants, which are actually going to try to sell their excess electronic components, right? So you know we know that that is happening. Probably by the end of this year, by the end of summer, that is going to get cooled down, and hopefully by December you can do what I did in terms of negotiating the price of your car, you know, in <laughs> in a much better you know way. At least you can give a reference to me and say that you heard that from me. If you can pronounce my name or by then, you know, still remember it. Now, um, uh, the, in terms of a Spryker, you know, we, again, we, 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 um, we started with them back in 2016. You know, we had founded the company back in 2015, just a couple of month old company. We had zero software development experience. In fact, I was put in charge of this because I'm, I was the only engineer, you know, among, you know, our business team. And uh, um, we started, you know, uh, uh, back in, we, we started negotiating and understanding selecting, you know, we were um, interviewing a lot of or uh, um, um, vetting a lot of different um, technology providers, Spryker's competitors, and we made a decision by the end of 2016, we're going to go with a Spryker, I'm going to talk about it, why. We started developing in 17, eight months later without a single software developer in our team. I just hired the chief engineer who is still today with us, um, and uh, we, we just went live, you know, um, in middle of 2018. 
with a beat up product and by the end of the year, you know, we actually announced it to the rest of the world. So that was you know, quite a bit of, a, um, in my opinion, already a success on its own because we didn't have a clue about you know, having software development. We were already in a projection of a half a billion dollar, $400 million plus revenue last year. And as I said, by this year, we've gotten to a billion dollar with a massive lead generation coming from SourceEngine.com you know, and obviously collateral business as well as a business inside SourceEngine.com that I have actually a couple of slides you know, to show you what that looks like. Why did we choose Spryker? I used a very uh, old uh, terminology, you know, which is modularity. I just saw on the presentations of um, uh, um, um, uh, Boris and Elena that they use composability. That's probably a, you know, a, a better word. Um, we essentially could choose, uh, you know, select what we wanted to go live with as opposed to many other technology providers. You know, for example, we did our own PIM development because it was too complicated. You know, um, in terms of, um, okay, then it was not a billion SKUs, but it still was like a couple of um, hundred million SKUs. And these um, SKUs, they're basically, you know, have an a, a alternate relationship to each other because component manufacturers try to make the same microcontrollers, the same CPUs. You know, I'm sure, you know, you, you know th those are easy words to understand. You know, so there's that sophistication plus 11,000 manufacturers, a couple of thousand merchants and all the rest. It was too difficult. So we elected to do our own PIM, you know, which is, you know, um, then with robust APIs, get it working together with the rest of the uh, um, um, Spiker, you know, um, um, available uh, um, uh, tech stack. Um, they had a good experience with B2B, right? That was really important for us because, again, the B2B buyer's experience is very different. You know, these guys get paid to buy electronic components. Um, uh, the, the Spiker was well positioned even then and more so now in terms of the experience, you know, in the B2B market. And, of course, the scalability, right? You know, the... Uh, their tech stack was not difficult. We could easily find outside developers that they were willing to adopt, you know, to work on, you know, Spryker, you know, and it was really important for us. And as I said, you know, without a single developer, we actually went live, you know, within eight months. And then later, in the next couple of months, we actually moved all of that development in-house. And today we have our own developers happy to build on a Spryker and move forward. And we're still obviously, you know, um, um, using a Spryker, you know, for our day-to-day -day development. Now, um, what does is, what is Source Engine look like? You know, so as I said, 36, you know, 100 plus merchants. You know, our average basket size are $8,000 plus and growing. It is, you know, this is a B2B market. Nobody buys, you know, in our shop. We make it almost impossible. We have like a minimum order value of $500 anyway, right? You know, and we make it very difficult for the buyer, you know, to, who's not prepared to spend quite a bit of money, you know, to buy on SourceEngine.com. You know, there are other websites, other e-commerce websites that are more you know, uh, um, uh, um, preferred for that. We have an example checkouts of over a half a million dollars with credit card using our, um, um, yeah, that was, that was a bit shocking, but you know, obviously, you know, <laughs> Amex does a good job of giving you enough kickback you know, on your, um, on your uh, points, you know, so that made it attractive you know, for that user to do as a medical company. Um, we have tools like you know, the Bill of Material, the code engine, which allows you to buy bulk purchases you know, like a $280,000 checkout using that. And um, it is our number one lead generation. It's almost like our sales team, you know, have gotten too used to just getting new customers all the time coming from Source Engine. I always complain about that because they're almost like, you know, making no efforts in terms of lead generation or getting new customers because Source Engine, you know, does that for them very beautifully. Um, now, we, as I said, you know, we continue to use Spryker. It is, it is a fundamental part of our marketplace e-commerce platform, you know, um, we continue to have it, you know, as a main part of our development, you know, moving forward, you know, and, and I don't see a change on that. I always get to ask, you know, well, you, you know, are you going to adopt a different technology or, you know, all the rest? No, you know, we'll continue to be there because um, it has been very productive for us and weaning away from a already existing working solution, you know, with no reason just because you want to try something else. You know, it's obviously not funny, right? So we, we obviously, um, so we're, we're determined to continue. We've been enjoying the roadmap, you know, like what Elena showed, you know, taking that advantage and learning from there, you know, and, and move that forward, you know, for our, you know, future moving, moving forward. Um, what else do we have in the back, you know, in sourceability? Um, our target persona is the professional buyer of electronic components. You know, that is an operational buyer, are the people that they're making sure the production lines run, right, you know, and manufacturing occurs. Now, in our industry, it's a very rich industry. It's over a trillion dollar on a total revenue and growing on a 10% a year. It's the only industry that, whether there's gonna be recession, hopefully not, or whatever, will continue to grow by 10% you know, on a yearly basis. That is the forecast. Because there's electronic components everywhere, obviously, right? 
um, um, there is a persona there that is a strategic buyer, right? So it tries to, you know, obviously they didn't get it right, you know, during the pandemic. I'll laugh about it. But um, now they try to make sure, especially from the high reliability customers, right? like, for example, the automotive, they try to make sure that they stay ahead of the curve. They don't make the same mistakes that they've done before. They don't get into the shortages. You know, like an example, we sold microcontrollers that were around $7 to these companies at like a couple thousand dollars. You know, there were stories about, I was mentioning that yesterday, where one of the automotive companies in Germany bought washing machines, you know, from another German, you know, a, a white goods manufacturer to extract the microcontrollers out because it made sense, you know, even if they spent a thousand dollar, which, you know, they had to scrap off the rest of the, uh, uh, you know, good, you just still get their hundred thousand dollar cars out. So they try to make sure that they don't get into that space anymore. You know, and within that, um, we have essentially launched, you could say, a marketplace for data, right? So the, these users now are strategic buyers of electronic components. They try to stay ahead of the curve, right? You know, and they subscribe to datalink.com. That's the name of the website that we launched in 2022, which complements sourceengine.com, right? And they're able to get a lot of market intelligence, analytics, you know, and all sorts of different information there. You know, and uh, on top of that, in the electronic components, there's a whole big problem of obsolescence. Electronic components go, you know, um, um, obsolete. They're no longer life cycle. Live manufacturers trying to move on to the new components, right? You know, and it's got a lot of, you know, product information from that perspective, you know, moving forward. So that's our new endeavor. With that said, I'm done pretty much. I don't understand that clock, you know, but okay, it doesn't matter. I feel like, you know, I'm almost at the end of my journey because I just saw, you know, uh, <laughs> You out here, Chris. So Brilliant. I hope that I did justice. You know, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Shah. Absolutely. Before, okay. uh, before you, I, I just want to thank you, Shah. A long time customer of Spryker, and uh, thank you for your story. I always, I always learn more about your wonderful industry. Thank you. We've got some new customers. We've got some people who've been around a while. If you were to share one tip for these guys to take away, what would, they, what would you give these guys as a tip? Uh, I'm putting um, you on the spot here. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. <laughs> Um, I actually was sharing that with uh, uh, one of your uh, potential customers. Um, you know, don't listen to your engineers. They always, you know, the software engineers I'm talking about, <laughs> they always want an easy route out, you know, and in business, you obviously have your aspirations and how you're going to run your company. So you're going to have to insist and stay on top of them. You know, it costs you a little bit of a blood pressure like with me, you know, and some other anxieties, but in the end of the day, you get there. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank awesome. you, Shah. Really Thank great. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. So